This is chapter 15, Psychosocial Development in Late Life. Uh, to start with, let's look at um, where we are in the timeline. The early life habits have been found in the literature to have the greatest impact on quality of life and health in late life. It's kind of like comparing um, fluid intelligence with crystallized intelligence. It's, it's another harvesting of earlier habits for benefit later on in life. This becomes really relevant because this is going to be the center of focus for using health promotion or health psychology practices in medicine. So if you plan on going into, um, into any kind of health care, like uh, being a physician, nurse, uh, therapist of any kind, physical therapist, um, uh, certainly a mental health professional, any, anything like that the things to consider are the impact that intervention early can have on later in life. Also, it's a significant social policy issue when it comes to the health of the population and any individual in it, because um, health care policies at a social level, like, for example, the availability of preventive medicine and primary care early in life, and uh, education to the public about healthy healthcare practices early, as well as regulations that make the food supply more healthy, uh, dietary supplements more healthy, and um, the workplace policies that allow people the ability to maintain uh, you know, activity and physical health. Those are all things that can have significant impact later on. So, uh, wellness later in life is affected by, you know, availability of uh, primary care. That is, you can intervene in uh, certain illnesses very early before they, you see the secondary effects of those. Um, and, and then just generally how clean the water is and the air quality uh, and uh, things like that. So this is what I would call the looking forward versus um, the uh, symptom management approach to medicine. The disease model in traditional medicine that uh, focuses primarily on diagnosis and treatment of syndromes. So the main thing is to get a diagnosis and then attack the symptoms themselves. So in this system, a well person is someone who's not sick. So you focus on the sickness and cure. Uh, the problem is, is that you don't really have a focus on that individual until they um, exhibit some kinds of, of symptoms, which brings us to the wellness model. The wellness model is kind of the opposite. The focus is on improving overall health and building resilience against disease. And this is actually a big topic in health psychology, but it's also a, a growing concern in health promotion. And it's more of a, a 21st century approach to medicine because uh, what the emphasis is on is uh, making a person a poor host for disease. That is, the focus is on wellness rather than disease. And so what you're looking uh, at is uh, the person and you're looking forward. So it takes advantage of the whole notion that uh, a little bit of prevention early on uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, which means that uh, when you're looking down the road, uh, you know, where is a person headed? So uh, you'd be more inclined to think of what kind of conditions is this person in it? And are there any signs that I can detect that show that they are not as well as they could be and that those uh, that that lack of wellness could end up uh, causing some you know, organ a degradation or failure or disease later on down the road. So many, many conditions are subject to early life uh, states of wellness, uh, like uh, heart disease, um, arthritis, uh, type 2 diabetes, um, and uh, other conditions like that. So what we're really going to look at is what are the early life habits that can have a positive impact on preventing disease in later life. Now, a concept that's important in looking at a person's functionality is, are there habit patterns that 
uh, or stimulus cues in the environment that pull them up to a higher state of health. And this is where we have to look at the concept of environmental press. So we have two factors that are important here. One of them is competence, and that is what state a person's in, what skills they have, how strong they are, what their cognitive skills, how confident are they, uh, what's their general state of sensory function. Uh, those are uh, all under the heading of competence. And, and uh, on the other end of the spectrum there, uh, to, to, uh, or the other end of the equation is environmental press. Environmental press is the how demanding the environment is um, and what kinds of stressors there are or personal interactions there are, uh, you know, and uh, what are some of the environmental challenges. Now, uh, when a person's in their zone of maximum comfort, then the level of competence is slightly ahead of environmental press. When the zone, uh, when a, a person is challenged by the environment, that is environmental press is slightly ahead of competence, then they're in the zone of maximal performance potential. So your performance gets pushed up by demand from the environment. Um, and then adaptations when environmental press and competence are sort of in balance. That's when, when a person's competence comes up to the level of press and that's the person has adapted to that higher level of function functioning demanded by the environment. So a real good example of this is uh, why do people in northern climates, in, in urban areas up north like Chicago, New York, places like that, why do they have lower rates of heart disease than people in uh, the south in places like Texas and um, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, and places like that, where we have higher incidence of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, um, um, clinical obesity, hypercholesterolemia, and all the, all the things that can cause general health problems uh, are more common in the southern climates and then up in the north. Even though the weather is actually better in the south, you have warm weather, people are out more up north, you have lots of cold weather, but there's some traits about living up north, some characteristics of living up north, as well as living in some foreign countries like uh, Europe, Germany, France, Belgium, Holland, places like that. And that is, is you'd also ask the question, well, why do people have lower rates of heart disease in places where they have mass transit? Well, when you live in a mass transit environment like New York or Chicago or, or Paris or London, places like that, you generally don't drive much because uh, they don't have a driving infrastructure that really accommodates all the population. Instead, they have a very well-established mass, mass transit structure, high-speed rail, uh, trolley rail, uh, and uh, they get around, and bicycles. And so they get around, uh, in fact, bicycles are actually the number one form of transportation in the world. Um, interestingly enough, when I was stationed in Europe, I actually uh, noticed, I, I took my bike to Amsterdam on the train and I was riding up the boulevard in Amsterdam and uh, to go to the central district. And I came to a stoplight and I noticed that I was completely surrounded by bicycles. I thought it was some kind of an event, but actually that's just life in Amsterdam. Thousands and thousands and thousands of bicycles. And that's how people get around there. They have very low rates of heart disease in that part of the world. Uh, so what that means is, is that when people use mass transit or when they're using uh, you know, human powered transport, in mass transit, there's a lot of walking. If you've ever been to New York or Chicago or Paris or, or London or any place like that where they have lots of mass transit and that's how you get around when you're visiting, you'll notice that you're gonna wear out a pair of shoes there. They tell you, take comfortable shoes when you go to Europe. And when you go to, to New York or uh, places like that, because you're going to do a lot of walking. So these people walk by routine. They also do a lot of cycling in places like that as transportation. If you go to Washington, D.C., for example, the road going from Arlington National Cemetery up into D.C. into the uh, mall around where the Capitol and the White House and the monuments are uh, in the Smithsonian and everything. There's a whole train of cyclists. Uh, that, that actually commute from Virginia, from the uh, outer areas up into Washington, D.C. to avoid traffic. And they've got trails that they can take to get up there. Those are all healthy habits. And uh, so 
if it's a person in the zone of maximum comfort too much, then they can gradually become less and less tolerant of any kind of environmental demand. And that can lead to a gradual decline. And some of the things that contribute to that are overuse of air conditioning, overuse of, mo of uh, power transportation, uh, and uh, the, the overuse of the kind of conveniences that, that cause us to avoid any state of discomfort. So how do we balance the two? Like, like deal with uh, uh, or be at our sort of maximum potential. And that is when uh, we have a balance between the two. Now, everyone wants to be in the zone of maximum comfort, especially when they're recovering in for, from you know, a disorder in some way or in their rest cycle. Uh, but spending some time or a proportion of the time in uh, performance, that is where the environment's demanding that you move around, uh, is what keeps a person active and uh, keeps them sort of proactive. It keeps them, you know, thinking about the next thing and, and then movement. Interesting uh, uh, anti-aging article I read said that inflammation starts to build up after sitting for only 20 minutes. So they recommend that even in a job situation, that a person get up and move around about every 20 to 30 minutes so that they don't spend too much time sitting still. Now, when a person gets older in the age group we're talking about now, you can get pooling of the blood supply that leads to an increase in the probability of having, you know, uh, deep vein thrombosis, which is uh, when you have a clot and a deep vein in the body or uh, things like that. So, um, Docility is being uh, dependent on, uh, on help so much that a person isn't self-starting. A few years ago, people started, especially civic planners, started looking at uh, you know, how to design cities and settings where people lived to improve their health. This is one area you know, that look, when you look at, at social and civic policy and how that can help the general health of the population and the health of each individual in it. And those are called blue zones. So they identified these blue zones where people tend to be healthier than people outside the blue zones. And uh, what they found was, is in blue zones, you tend to have uh, strong coalitions, uh, a sense of family among neighbors and friends, um, and uh, low rates of smoking, and, um, and other uh, kinds of self-abuse, like al excessive alcohol use. Um, a largely plant-based diet, uh, in including, uh, you know, uh, actually lots of green leafy uh, vegetables. Um, constant moderate physical activity with occasional kind of challenges to a person's maximum sense uh, strength level, strong sense of community, engagement in the community. And uh, so these are the kinds of things that designers of cities can plan into their environments. These are called walkable cities and uh, they build in these kinds of community zones where you mix housing, uh, dense, uh, high dense housing with low density housing in with retail and parks. And uh, instead of having these things sequestered off into to their own specific area, that's, the, that's called Euclidean planning. Instead, you mix it all up so that people can find it easier just to walk to the grocery store than to actually drive their car. Uh, and so uh, that helps to build an environment that cues people to be more healthy. Now, just as an example coming out of the Blue Zone research, we can look at two examples that they identified as, as Blue Zones. These are people that have an excess in the population that live over 100 years and uh, that have very low rates of earlier onset disease. So they don't, they, they're, they're don't, you don't really see um, a lot of chronic illness until very, very late in life. And you can see here that uh, they have kind of similarities in their 
uh, dietary habits. Uh, and what you see is very little uh, me, uh, meat in their diet. And actually, this doesn't indicate it, but the research shows that uh, meat in the form of fish and chicken uh, are significantly healthier for long term than red meats are. So a lot of programs now, like the Gundry diet, and some of those are eliminating red meat from the diet. And uh, you know, pescatarian diets where people eat uh, fish and the rest of their diets all uh, vegetables. Now here was an interesting comparison of blue zones. What you have here is a Venn diagram that compared Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, uh, Italy, and Loma Linda, uh, California. And uh, the middle of the diagrams where they all overlap, and you can see similarities as you go towards the middle of these three spheres in the Venn diagram. Uh, and so uh, that's what they all have in common which gives us more support for uh, looking at how communities are planned. There's a poem by William Ernest Henley who had an interesting experience. He wrote this poem while he was in the hospital suffering from tuberculosis and spondylitis, uh, termed Potts disease. He was in a lot of pain and incapacitated for quite a period of time. And uh, this poem references kind of his state of mind and how he uh, how it helped him, his state of mind helped him recover. Um, so it's called Invictus by William Ernest Henley, 1875. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I think whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the felt clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. So um, this is sort of a reflection of how being proactive and uh, and uh, sort of pushed, motivated to overcome uh, disease really helps people in their recovery. Now let's look at Eric Erickson's stage. Uh, this is the last stage, ego integrity versus despair. And the syntonic state is ego integrity, which is uh, a person's life review uh, and the choices that, that they've made result in positive affective response to how their life's gone. They see, sort of see their life as an entire story, and they're prone to uh, reminiscence because it's a pleasant experience. So reminiscence is normal for older folks, especially the ones who um, think back uh, in their uh, review their life as as uh, being uh, satisfied and pleasurable ego transcendence is this perception that uh, there's something that's left beyond life after uh, a life ends um, and uh, some people ego transcendence transcendence is reflected as the belief in an afterlife so it's common for folks that had some kind of religious belief system or were spiritual in nature earlier in life to revisit that later in life. Uh, and so uh, that's a form of ego transcendence, the idea that uh, the person continues in some form after they're dead. Another form of ego transcendence is uh, looking at the impact a person's had on the people in their life and what they're leaving behind in their children or grandchildren or their legacy. Legacies become real important to some people. And so in that case, they may uh, feel compelled to write their history or pass it on to their children. Um, I knew someone who, a patient of mine who uh, late in his li life uh, began to reminisce. His daughter told me that 
uh, they were having a holiday, and I can't remember what holiday it was, but they were all at, the, at his house, and uh, his wife had died earlier. This is their grandfather. And uh, so uh, they were having this conversation, and they knew that he had served uh, in the military in World War II, but he had never talked about his uh, his military service. Uh, and so they got to talking to him, and for the first time, he actually began to speak of his military service during World War II, and, it, and that led him up to an attic room where they had a... Uh, where he had his army chest and he opened it up and he had medals in there and awards and some uh, a few pictures from his combat experience when he was served in uh, the uh, Ardennes uh, during the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. And she said that he just had this outpouring of details about all of the people that he had lost in the war and his experiences in the war and she had no idea that he had been in combat in World War II. He'd never told anybody about it. Okay, the opposite of the syntonic state and ego integrity is the dystonic state or despair. And this is when the life review uh, comes with unpleasant, kind of unsettled or unresolved uh, conflicts and a negative affect. They have a poor adjustment aging. They may reject younger people. You can start to see this earlier during the generativity versus stagnation stage, which happens in midlife. Those people tend not to age as well as people who are generative in midlife. Uh, so that's why an adjustment in midlife can have a dramatic effect on how somebody ages after that. So uh, having a poor adjustment to aging can lead to a negative affect and risk of depression and uh, immobility. So uh, they see their life as, there, there's not a, a sense of ego integrity. They, uh, they tend to see their life as terminated. And so they don't have as much focus on an afterlife or a legacy, and they be, may become more withdrawn and uh, uh, prone to uh, depression and despair. Now, how to operationalize functionality in late life uh, is uh, this This is done with two measures that are important, especially when you're looking at placement in a person either deciding to live, you know, in an um, open, you know, larger kind of place that requires a lot more maintenance versus a 55 and older restricted community versus a, a, uh, a retirement community versus a assisted living center versus a nursing home. And so what makes that determination are two factors. One of them is called the activities of daily living or ADLs. And that's when a person, that, that's a person's basic self-care abilities like eating, bathing, toiling, walking, or dressing. IADLs are instrumental activities of daily living. And these are the activities that require intellectual competence, like making financial decisions, paying bills, doing their own maintenance, cooking driving or being able to access some form of transportation. Now, usually IADLs go first. So in, let's say, look, look at a healthy aging process. As a person declines with in late life, and say they they've have a, a long functioning life, a long functional life, then they'll, they're going to see some decline in their IADLs first. So they're going to require some assistance in making financial decisions, paying bills, remembering things, maintenance around their domicile. Uh, cooking their meals and some things like that, but they can still live independently with just some assistance. So, and when it, with a decline in IEDLs, you get either get help from family members, or uh, they can go to an assisted living facility, or some facility that's kind of a hybrid, where of a retirement place where they have access to services, but the services don't actually come into your home. Now, a, um, when ADLs decline, this is activities of daily living, this is when a person is going to need some kind of significant assistance, starting with advanced uh, assisted living or into nursing care. Now, nursing care usually begins when a person's mental uh, faculties are not um, sufficient or they require uh, RN skilled care. Um, so, um, 
when ADL starts to decline, and there's actually two scales that you can use to kind of assess these, uh, IADL scale and an ADL scale uh, that uh, is used to operationalize what needs a person's going to have. Now, this is another issue in looking at the social level, the planning, because uh, one uh, term that planners, community planners use now is called age in place planning. And that's when you design the community so that people can stay in their homes longer. Um, and, uh, National League of Cities is a organization of cities that they send their planners and their, um, their elected officials to these conferences and some of the things they talk about there are you know how to build in walking communities mixed use communities with retail and residents intermixed you know uh, what kind of access to mass transit do they have and healthcare services in their community and anything that kind of keeps a community stable because the longer people can live in their own homes and live independently and stay there the more stable the community is so transients in a community is instability. Now, it's not real great for real estate agents, but for the community itself, the more stable a community is with regard to how long people remain in their homes, the better. And just like we talked about a minute ago, levels of housing in these restrict in these uh, communities, you need to plan in some levels of housing, which uh, means that mixed in with the single family dwellings and the, what are called, you know, the larger lots, you also need some 55 and older restricted communities that are called retirement communities, assisted living centers and skilled nursing centers in the community so that, you know, uh, people will have different levels of, of uh, living uh, situations in that community. And that um, is how you see a healthier community. Now, there's some political pushback with some of this because a lot of times people confuse restricted or retirement communities or any kind of group living center as multi-family dwellings and uh, stuff like that. So uh, sometimes it's an issue for a city council to try to get this done. Now, one of the things that's helped with, um, you know, the age in place is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, and that has, now there are several titles in the Americans with Dis Disabilities Act. Some of them deal with people earlier in life, like employment. Uh, and that is, is, you know, what kinds of, of accommodations as a person entitled to to allow them to maintain employment uh, and then there's uh, you know title two dealing with um, public provision of transportation especially for people that have difficulty with transportation and then three is public accommodations like uh, you know being able to get into commercial facilities and things like that uh, telecommunications, which is a requirement in communities. Now, now they've added internet access to that, where they're looking at uh, getting uh, uh, community-wide internet access. Uh, and then there's a, a, another variety of uh, miscellaneous provisions that pro provide um, for assistance for people to keep them autonomous and living in place much longer. The theory behind the ABA, the ADA is uh, that cities are taxpayer supported. The sidewalks, the streets, the infrastructure, the water, utilities, all that stuff is taxpayer supported. That's what gets the uh, services to the businesses so that they can uh, stay in business. So the taxpayers are paying for all of the things that the community does, the citizens in the community, pay their taxes to enable businesses to have uh, uh, streets and access to these, these businesses. So what that means is, is that people are entitled to be able to access those businesses, which means that uh, even people who have difficulty uh, with uh, mobility have the right to access those facilities because they um, pay taxes. And uh, so this actually started with the schools and, uh, and then became the Americans with Disabilities Act. It started out in the schools with uh, uh, House uh, Public Law 94-142, which said that uh, kids are part of tax-paying families, so they have a legal right to an education. So you can't 
uh, you can't keep them from getting an education because they're, say, can't hear or they can't see or they can't walk. You have to provide them an education. So that's how the Americans with Disabilities Act was sort of an outgrowth of uh, 94142. Now, one thing that we have uh, an abundance of that we have not had in the past is assistive technologies. And these are other things that allow people to be autonomous longer. The longer you can keep a population autonomous, and keep their functional age low enough so that they can, and their, their functionality high enough so that they can remain autonomous, the less you have to spend on services for them. So um, this is just a list of all of the, the technologies that we uh, have available, much of which is covered by Medicare and Medicaid, and some of it's covered uh, by uh, the community, and some of it's uh, required in the Americans with Disabilities Act and has to be covered by people doing business, like ramps and things like that. One of the assistive technologies that's really going to help is uh, cell phones, and uh, especially smartphones. Now, younger people have adapted well to smartphones, and so as this cohort of people that are midlifers now that have become very well adapted to smartphones, they're going to have a lot easier time of it because of all the benefits that you get from uh, being able to use a smartphone. That is having ready access to rides, 911, GPS, calendars, ways to put notes, uh, being able to get on the internet and look things up. Those are all things that can increase a person's functionality to, to delay aging. And we're seeing it in cars now. So we've got lane assist, Auto stop, uh, smart cruise, backup cameras, uh, and all of this stuff that they're building into cars that's actually going to help people be safer in cars longer, you know, because we are on such a car dependent uh, transportation system. Now, uh, probably in the next uh, several decades, we're going to see a movement into uh, autonomous transportation and a, and a building of mass transit. Uh, which is long, long overdue.